Okay, I'm going to talk to you guys today about uh, extending Prolog. Okay, so Prolog, this is a tour of metaprogramming in one of the most powerful metaprogramming languages. So Prolog is probably one of the best languages out there uh, for just thinking about programming languages. There's a few that probably uh, could, could uh, vie with Prolog for, for that title but most of them are also based on Prolog. So maybe like Lambda Prolog uh, and, a, and a few others like that, Beluga, some, some others uh, that do a little bit with binding of variables uh, that Prolog doesn't do, which would be nice to have. But compared to C or Rust or uh, Lisp or really any other programming language, it's one of the best for reasoning about other programming languages, including itself. So Prolog is a very cool programming language, but it's even better as a meta language. So it's, it's nice, it's cool, you can write programs in it, but you can also reason about programs quite handily inside of Prolog. So what does it mean to be meta? Well, it means showing or suggesting explicit awareness of itself or oneself as a member of its category. So cleverly self-referential, that's a definition of meta. So meta programming is uh, reasoning about uh, programs themselves. So uh, there is a problem though. So uh, in Prolog, it's quite natural to describe relations between things, but writing a function can be a pain. And in a sense, functions are um, more specific than relations. Uh, a function can be seen uh, as a specific subset of relations. So the graph of a function is a kind of relation, a special relation where you, uh, where you have some restrictions on, on what you can lead to. So if you have um, something on the left-hand side of a function, then the, the output of the function uh, has to be the same. Every time you put the same thing in one side, something comes out the other side. So that, that's what makes it a function. Whereas a relation, you could have multiple different outputs for a single input and vice versa in other directions. So it's more of a, a relation between things. It's not just a, a sort of a, a one-way system. Okay, so what does this problem look like in Prolog? Well, the problem manifests itself in something like the absolute value function. So this is a function. The absolute value takes an input value, which is either positive or negative, and it always outputs a positive number. Uh, so if it's negative one, the absolute value is one. If it's one, the absolute value is one. Okay, so uh, how would we implement this in Prolog? Well, first we, we have one case where we have x is greater than or equal to zero. And in that case, we just pass the number through. So the output is the same as the input. Now, if the number, if the input is less than zero, then we pass out the negative uh, of the input as the output. And then that becomes, an, since the negative of the negative is a positive, uh, the output is then positive. So, um, Execution in Prolog is non-deterministic. So what does that mean? So that means when you, when you put a value into a predicate, you can get multiple different values out. It's a relational programming language, not a functional programming language. So uh, when we call abs, uh, we put in the value three and we get out three, but then the program tries to execute again. And this time it fails, okay? But we, uh, we we ended up running the program twice. You can try this with uh, the prompt in Prolog. You ask for the trace of abs, and it'll tell you how it's doing the searches through, through the uh, absolute value function. So our answer was right, but we thought about it too hard. So we, we actually ended up doing two different branches when we really only needed to calculate one of the different branches because this is a function, it's not a relation. So we didn't have to do as much work as we did. We tried both clauses. So computation in Prolog is really a proof search. It's, a, it's an attempt to find a proof of something, or it's actually, you can think of it as a refutation also. That's another a, a sort of dual way of thinking about it, but we, we won't bother with that. So there were two choices for the absolute value. Here it's represented as a tree. There's two different clauses that are associated with the abs of uh, x, y. Uh, the one where x is greater than or equal to zero and the one where x is less than zero. So two choices, two searches. Okay, but it's only two searches. You might say, well, yes, but what does it look like when you have lots of choices uh, presented at any, 
at every single branch, you have a bunch of new branches coming along. And pretty soon, proof search starts looking like this horrible exponential tree. So you have tons of choice points all over the place. Uh, this takes up memory, and it's uh, computationally expensive. And it grows really badly. So, uh, you know, even though we, we've actually seen when we had um, bugs in the uh, query system where we added too many choice points, they grow just tremendously uh, over time. So if you, you, you're reading in a file and it has a million rows and you're creating only two choice points each time, they pile up and pretty soon you run out of memory and you're doomed. Okay, so there was an early idea about how to deal with this um, problem that came up, I can't remember what year, but pro very, very early in the development of Prologue. Uh, and they decided to try to find a way to clip off branches of the tree that they knew were dead, okay? And so that that's called the cut. So I don't know how many of you guys have uh, played with cut yet, but uh, it's um, it's a way of, reducing the number of computations that take place. So now we can rewrite the uh, absolute value um, as when x is greater than or equal to zero, we put a cut. So we actually put this exclamation point in. Uh, and then what happens is we reduce the number of searches that we perform in the case when x is greater than or equal to zero. So if we get past the clause where x is greater than or equal to zero and we arrive at the cut, we clip all of the other branches for the absolute value function. And then x is only equal to y after that point. And we never try the other branch. So that's nice because we've reduced the space of uh, that we're searching. For x is less than zero, we still have to do two branches. We have to go into the first one and do the x is greater than or equal to zero branch, but then we fail immediately there and we can try the next branch. And that's that's sort of uh, inevitable. We're gonna have to try all of the conditions anyhow that, that we are looking for. So well, nothing's perfect, but uh, at least we've done less computation uh, than, than previously. And now this absolute value is not too much different than the kind of case statement that you might have in a functional programming language. And it doesn't do too much extra, extra work. Unfortunately, cut has a lot of problems. So uh, it kills the logical reading of programs uh, and it, it can introduce, it introduces something that's very procedural. It's no longer a re relational programming language. Uh, it can be used, there's something called a green cut. So you can use cut in such a way that you don't break the declarative reading. However, if you're doing that, then you're sort of acting as a, a human compiler. So you're, you're actually sort of inserting cuts in places where it doesn't change the semantics, uh, but, but it improves the search performance. And that's really something that ideally a compiler would be doing. So what are the semantics of cut? Well, they're very, very complicated uh, because of the fact that it cuts off other possible choices. Um, and it's, it's not very bright. It just, you know, it's a very simple and it's, it's like a, a, a sledgehammer approach to programming. So the, the worst part about this though, is that the impossibility of the alternative branch was already present in the source code. So the source code already says that uh, x is greater than or equal to zero. So there's no possible way that uh, if we've gone past that, that the other branch could ever succeed. So it's, it's clear from looking at the source code that this is the case. So that cut is perfectly semantically appropriate. It doesn't change the semantics in any way other than changing the, 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 the proof search so that it's faster, um, which usually is not considered part of the semantics. And why is that? It's because x greater than or equal to zero and x less than or equal to uh, less than zero is false. There's no x for which that's true. Uh, so both of the conditions cannot simultaneously be met. So once you've crossed the first condition, you don't have to do the second condition. Okay, so our compiler should know better. It uh, is not a very bright compiler at the moment. Uh, it should be smarter uh, and it's quite it's po quite possible to make it smarter. So what, what do we need? We need uh, 
the compiler to know that x greater than or equal to zero and x less than zero is false. Uh, prolog by itself doesn't know how to do this. So if you try to put those two uh, statements next to each other, prolog doesn't know, really know what to do with it. It's actually already false if you say x is greater than or equal to zero, or, or you might get an instantiation error. I can't, can't remember one of the two. Um, but it's not going to tell you that these things are, are uh, disjoint. However, uh, constraint logic programming can. And we have a library already built into uh, Swipple uh, called CLPR, which knows this. Uh, so if you use the module CLPR and you try putting in these two statements inside of these curly braces, which is how um, constraints are represented in CLPR, uh, it says false right away. So it knows. So we already have the chops. We just need to use them, right? So all of that already exists. So what else do we tr tend to decide branches on. So what are the kinds of things that clip that, that we actually use in practice to clip branches? Well, Swipple only uh, indexes on the first argument of a predicate. And that indexing means that it can see if you use uh, disjoint structures in the first argument of a predicate, it will be able to decide that, in fact, uh, these are disjoint clauses. Um, however, that's not it's not actually able to do arbitrary structural equality. So if you have uh, different clauses in which the different clauses are clearly disjoint, uh, Swipple can't determine that automatically. And this is a problem that comes up literally every day. We, I see it in the code that I write, and that's kind of a problem. Uh, however, it's actually really easy to, uh, to write a compiler or a preprocessor -pre for the compiler that will uh, eliminate all of these cases of structural inequality and insert a cut where it's possible to uh, reason that they are semantically equivalent with the cut or without. And why is it that this doesn't already exist? This is something that kind of surprises me. So Prolog so good as a meta language. It's so e easy to write one of these. Uh, and yet it's, it's not already out there. I find that a little bit surprising. And I, I think there's just been a real lack of attention uh, to these sorts of cases in the community. And I think we should fix them. I have a prototype written for structural equality that, and the, um, the optimizer is literally 50 lines long with test cases. So that's how simple it is to do in Prolog. Um, okay, so what else do we tend to decide branches on? Uh, the type of things. So list, number, integer, dict, string, and atom. So asking what the type of a variable is is a super common way to try to determine which case we're supposed to be in. And in the terminus code base, this comes up 828 times where we're trying to test uh, the type of something for a clause. Uh, what's the other most common? Well, the other one is the boundedness status. So whether a variable is bounded, bound to, uh, a whether it's a variable still, whether it's a non-variable or whether it's ground. And these cases, uh, there's 117 times that we use this in the terminus code base. Uh, now, boundedness status is extra logical. What, what does that mean? It means it, it really complicates the semantics because it, it breaks the logical reading. Now, there's still ways of using it that are logical or that allow uh, the user of a predicate to not know uh, that it's extra logical. And that's sort of uh, the black magic of Prolog is trying to figure out how to use var, non var, and ground in such a way that the user of the predicate doesn't have to know about that. But in practice, it is widely used, uh, and we do decide branches on it. So we'd like to be able to deal with that. So there's another, there's another old idea in Prolog, which is the idea of the guarded clause. And what this does is it says, uh, OK, so instead of just having this clause uh, x greater than or equal to zero, I'm going to say it's a guard. So I'm going to say that uh, we only fire off the first version if we get past the guard. If we get past the guard, then we're stuck and we, we've become de deterministic. We're not going to try any of the other clauses. Um, and this, is, this has been used in Prolog, especially it was uh, widely uh, investigated for parallel programming in the 1980s by the Japanese. Um, and it's kind of an interesting idea. It just, you have a sub language. Uh, that you're allowed to use in the guarded clauses that are simple. Okay, so what kind of sublanguage might we have in a guarded in the guarded clauses? Well, 
we can just choose a, a subset of prolog that includes um, these sorts of relations on uh, numbers. So x less than, x uh, greater than or equal to, equal to or less than. We can have um, the conjunction of guards, a disjunction of guards, uh, a variable, a non-variable, a, a ground. Ground means that it's uh, that there are no variables in the term. It's a it's a variable free term. Um, integers, strings, numbers, atoms, um, and and that that can serve as as a language of guards. Oh, and most importantly, at the very end, negation. So the negation, we'll, and I'll come to that. That's a little bit complicated, but super common in the way that we write uh, clauses. Okay, so that's great. Uh, so we have an idea of, set, how to, of guarded clauses. So how do we use this to determine whether or not that allows us to find out if clauses are disjoint or not? Uh, okay, so we can do a source to source transformation. So we can, pro, we can take prolog and we can write new prolog that includes a cut whenever we're able to decide that guarded clauses are in fact provably disjoint. So this is easy-ish uh, in prolog uh, because we have something called term expansion. And term expansion allows you to hook into the compiler's uh, reader and transform prolog clauses from whatever they were input as into something else. Okay. Um, it's the high homoiconicity. What does that mean? Homoiconicity means that prolog terms are represented as terms in prolog. So it represents prolog programs as a prolog term. And that's somewhat convenient. Um, it, it still has uh, some problems because prolog, the, the language that they use for prolog terms is, uh, is a little bit uh, deficient. So in fact, the, the efficient and easy way to deal with it is to take prolog terms that come in, transform them into some reflected uh, term language, and then uh, reify them back into prolog. Um, and I, I might show you very quickly what I mean by that, because it sounds harder than it is. OK, so it would be handy, in fact, also to be able to talk about uh, bindings. But uh, that's not possible in, in Prolog. And I won't get into that right now, because it's a little bit complicated. So uh, we don't have to ever break the logical reading. We want a program transformation that is semantically pure in the sense that it never causes the, the uh, programmer to be confused about the semantics of the output. So we want the, the transform program to have exactly the same semantics as the input program. Uh, so we can do that by not putting a cut if we can't decide uh, it, that things are deterministic. But if you put a guarded clause, you probably do want a warning that it, in fact uh, that, that you didn't get a guard. Okay. So now the question. So we solved the question of like how to prove if uh, x is greater than zero and x is less than or equal to zero is disjoint. But how do we prove that var x and non var x is false? Uh, what kind of language is this? Well, in fact, it's called a lattice. So uh, the technical mathematical term is a lattice. So what is a lattice? Now, I think this is a great picture here. And this is super useful theory. And I know it's a little bit scary to everybody. But we use the, this, this diagram here. It's called a Haas diagram. And a Haas diagram is a great way to represent multiple inheritance. Uh, and so Whenever you have multiple inheritance, you end up with one of these things. And since our data models are all using uh, OWL, we have these sorts of Haas diagrams are, are sort of implicit in all of our ontologies. So all of the ontologies that we represent have these. And uh, OK, so I say we're going to learn some category theory. You don't, don't get scared, because we, we don't have to know very much category theory here. All we need to know is that uh, there is an idea of the composition of arrows. So if we look down on this, this diagram here, we have uh, at the top, there's a set. It has x, y, and z in it. And then to the left of it, it has another set called x, comma, y. And you'll notice that this arrow is a relationship between x, y, and x, y, z. And that relationship is that x, y is completely contained in x, y, z. So it's sometimes called the subsumption uh, relation. 
it's an ordering relation. And in this case, it's the subset relation. So it means that x, y is a subset of x, y, z. OK? So in this, in this world, in this universe, x, y, z is, is, is also known as top. Top is the, the set of all things in our, in our uh, universe of discourse. So it's all of the things that we're allowed to talk about. And then at the very bottom is, a, is an element called bottom. In this case, bottom is the empty set. It has nothing in it. OK, and then we have this idea of composition of arrows, because if we can follow some chain of arrows to get to some other element, then that means that it's also a subset of that. So the empty set is a subset of everything. If you look on here, everything eventually uh, can get down by going backwards down through arrows to this empty set. Likewise, top is uh, reachable by everything by some number of arrows. So we can always imagine another arrow that goes between uh, any two boxes that, uh, that could be connected by a sequence of arrows. Okay, and that's what we mean by composition. And that's why it's a, a category. It's a category because the arrows compose. So it's possible to compose arrows. All of the arrows that are composable exist. Now, that doesn't mean that every, this is not a fully connected graph despite this. So if you look at, uh, this set X, the, the set that just has X in it, uh, it has no way of getting to the set Y and Z. So there is no sequence of arrows you can get to. And that's because X is not a subset of Y and, and, and Z. So there's, there's no uh, connection there. Okay, so we'll, we'll come back to this uh, picture in a little while. This Haas diagram is super, super important. So, um, and I, I think once you s have started seeing lattices, you'll see them everywhere. Okay. So yeah, so I just, okay. There, so there's another two uh, operations that happen on lattices that are very interesting. The first one is called join. Uh, so a join between two lattices is the first element higher in the graph than those two, okay? So if you take the set X and the set Z, the first element, that contain that that they both point to arrows by arrows two is the set x comma z. So th this is the join of x uh, uh, the set x and the set z. Now if you look at um, the set y z and the set x, the first one where they both reach is x y z. It's the set of everything or top. Okay. So the meet operation is the reverse. The meet is when you take like x, y, and y, z, and you say, okay, well, what's the first element below them in the graph that is reachable to, by bo uh, to both of them by arrows? And that is y, okay? So this is, this is the same idea as uh, the, uh, the intersection or uh, for, for the meet or the, the union for join in terms of sets. In OWL, it will be a similar thing. It'll be like whether or not you are subsumed by some, what is the element that subsumes two things is the join of those two things. And likewise, the thing that is subsumed by both things is called uh, the meet. Okay. So we use these in our ontologies. Okay. But these, these uh, var and non-var and ground also uh, form a lattice, okay? So they, there is top, there's bottom, and then there's var, non-var, and ground. Now it's kind of a funny lattice. It's not very big. It's a small lattice, <laughs> um, and, but we can use this as the domain uh, in which to decide whether or not, what happens when you have the conjunction uh, of, or the meet or the, the join of two things. Now, if you look here, uh, the meet, the, the join of var and ground is top, and its meet is bottom. However, if you join non-var and ground, you get non-var. And if you get, if you take the meet of non-var and ground, you get ground. So the, the so it's kind of a, f a funny lattice. And that's important. What it means is that you're getting more specific in terms of the information about something when you take the meet of it, and you, you get less specific in terms of the information you know about something when you take the join. Okay. Okay, great. So now we have meet and join uh, diagrammatically. Anyhow, uh, we we can see it on the picture, and we can we can take those operations for var and non-var and ground. 
but how do we calculate this um, from the arrow? And another problem is that a common guard that we want to use is not var. Okay, so the negation of something. And that negation doesn't appear in this lattice anywhere. So uh, that, that's going to be a, a little bit of a problem. So we need an idea of a complement for something. However, our, uh, this, this lattice actually does not admit a comp complement. Uh, and, and the reason for this is that uh, what do we need for a complement? Well, the laws are that, um, that the meat of the two things is the negation of the two things should be bottom. The negation of the join of the neg negative of something and itself should be top. And we should have that under our order, the order reverses if we negate both of the elements. But finally, we need that the negation of the negation is the thing itself, okay? So we don't have that the negation of the negation is the thing itself here. It's not possible to do that. And the reason for that is, is pretty clear. So if you say, <clears throat> Uh, this thing is not ground. Uh, well, then it means that it it doesn't mean that it's a variable necessarily. So if it's not ground, it could be a non-variable. It could be that it's a term that has a variable in it. Uh, so that that's a bit of a problem here. Okay. So well, okay. So we can't get a a, a complement, but we can get a pseudo complement. So a pseudo complement is true if uh, whenever we take the pseudo complement, then the join of every element of that pseudo complement uh, together with it is bottom. And the, uh, and the meet with that pseudo complement is top. Okay, so we can co actually construct this automatically from the diagram. So we can go back to our diagram. We can, we can figure out all of the negations. And actually here, Negations are very easy to, to find uh, in, the, the, uh, in a complete lattice of subsets. And actually, that's actually how, how uh, I, I obtain our complements. I actually utilize the full subset of all, all possible elements uh, in the lattice. And then you use that to generate a new lattice that it admits a pure complement. Okay, so in this in this example, let's look at these laws very quickly. So we want that um, the the negation of an element uh, when we meet with it, we get bottom, and when we join with it, we get top. So if we look here, what is the meet that's going to give us bottom, but join to give us top? Well, the 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 for y and z, the negation is x. And if you look at that, what it is is it's the uh, it's the complement of the universe. It's the universe of discourse minus ourselves gives us our complement. And the, you can see that the meat of these two things uh, is is the empty set. It's the only place where they meet. And the join of these two things is top. It's the it's both of the things together. So you see that there's this this kind of interesting lattice shape where x y z uh, at the top its complement is the the null set, and then you have like y z its complement is x, x y its complement is z, and x z its complement is y. So that you can see there's some kind of shape to the to the negations in this lattice. Okay, this is maybe a little bit too much. Sorry, folks. <laughs> Okay, so that's great. Um, we have a way to form these. We can just imagine that now we have these lattices over variables and non-variables. But I also want to do this for types. So I want integer. I want uh, you know uh, dictionary. Everything. I want to be able to represent all of the types as well in a lattice. And that that lattice is. Um, do I have the lattice picture somewhere? I don't have the lattice picture. Sorry, I didn't draw it. Uh, it's a bigger lattice. Uh, and, and not as complicated, uh, but bigger. So we can also do, uh, we can take the product of lattices and then that will also have a meet operation. So we can take a product of lattices 
and create a super lattice with products of lattices that have joins and meets. Uh, and then we can, we can reason about those. So that allows us to have multiple different domains, uh, constraint domains that are all happening simultaneously. And we do all of the I lost, you. I lost your sound there, Gavin. Gavin, hello. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry. He's fixing his mic. Yes. Sorry about that. Okay, you're back. <laughs> you're back. It's power. Uh, okay, so, yes. Okay, so right now you can just imagine it as a bunch of, uh, of uh, constraints all happening sort of in parallel. Okay, so how do I solve these? Well, we can use constraint lo logic programming tricks. Uh, so we define a new uh, constraint domain that allows us to specify which of these parallel domains we're in, and we run them all in parallel simultaneously. Okay, so what does this look like in Prolog? Well, uh, you can actually write it down like this. So we have a domain X and we say, its top in the boundedness domain and its variable in the boundedness domain at the same time. And that means it's a variable in the boundedness domain. So those, that's the meat of the two things. It does the meat automatically. Uh, if you have a boundedness domain and you take the meat with the type domain, then it's just both of those things at the same time. Uh, and if you say like, okay, I'm string at types and integer at types at the same time, that's false. It's impossible to be a string and an integer at the same time. Okay, so that's, it actually looks very simple once you actually start playing with it in, in a prolog prompt. So now we can perform our program transformation. That was a little bit of work. And what happens is we go through, we check to see if the guards are disjoint. So every subsequent guard should be disjoint from the one that we're currently looking at. And if it is, we replace this guard symbol with a cut. And that's all there is to it. And if, if it's not, if it's not possible, to prove that they are disjoint, then we actually replace it with a star cut. And the star is our internal way of saying uh, that this next clause is not gonna be run. So it doesn't run the cut, but it documents that we put it there. And that way, when you do a listing of the program source code, you'll see that there's a star cut and you'll know, oh geez, I was not able to, the, or the compiler was not able to prove this for me. So this is an example of a predicate that's actually in terminus that uh, we can write the guard for. Uh, so we have atoms, we, we have these equality constraints because the first term uh, is like atom at language or atom uh, has type type. And then there's another that says, okay, well, the first element is an atom. The first element is an atom, first element is a string. So we have, the, we have a combination of boundedness as well, so there's non-var type, uh, and then there's negation, the atom of a, a value, and then there's a disjunction, there's atom or string. So we get all of these different kinds of things. And in fact, the, the uh, compiler is able to determine that there's uh, a cut in all of these cases. And we can actually uh, implement that. So in hindsight, uh, I probably shouldn't have spent so much time thinking about these lattice constraint <laughs> constraints on guards because far more common is just structural equality. Uh, and that was a lot of work sort of unnecessarily. Um, whereas, uh, but, but it was kind of cool in a way. So we, I also, uh, putting in explicit guards is kind of a, a hassle. If this is done properly, you don't, actually have to know anything about it. All you have to do is check to see what the maximal guard condition that is decidable by the prolog compiler is, extract it, and then utilize it to find out if we're disjoint with subsequent clauses, and then put in the cut if we are. And that's, so I'm going to refactor this. I'm not going to have an explicit guard. I'm just going to make it happen totally magically in the background, and it will just optimize the prolog code. Uh, and probably I should have done that in the first place, but there you go. Uh, so I'd still really like to add mode analysis. So mode analysis would allow a lot of other kinds of things to be done as well. 
and I haven't done that yet. And the other is gradual type checking. I could you you could use these sorts of uh, uh, tricks in order to do gradual type checking, where you can remove type checks where it's impossible in the in the program flow to get them, and then only retain them in program flows where where they're necessary. So that's that's the 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 long and the short of that. So I want to show one one other thing before we're, uh, we we uh, quit. So I'm just going to stop sharing this. I'm going to start sharing my my uh, code very quickly. Uh, okay, can you see that uh, program? Yes. All right. Okay. Yes. So the uh, so just two things very quickly. Um, uh, I want to show you. This is the equality optimizer here. Uh, it is uh, like twelve lines or something like that. <laughs> so this actually performs all of the disjoint checks uh, for equality for uh, the heads of clauses, and that's all there is to it. Most of the code is actually just tests. Um, then there's uh, reification, which is the, uh, this is what translates a, um, a program from, from uh, prologue source code into an internalized representation. And it's only, you know, 15 lines or so of code. Um, so you can see, and this works with everything that prologue has in its source code. That's all there is to it. So I mean, it's an amazing language for doing program transformation because it's so ridiculously simple to transform. So that's uh, that's that's it for now. So any questions? That's excellent, Gavin. Uh, that's amazing. Oh, fascinating, yeah. 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 Amazing. Uh, so, so a bunch of first of all a commentary on the. Uh, the kind of overlapping lattices in the um, for, with complements. Where are you, Kevin? We can't see you. Is, oh, oh, sorry. Excuse me. We'd is, like to see you. But my question and sort of comment is obviously um, category theory. The meets and joins are, are you know, it's it's a very not a, a far walk to union and intersection of, of set theory, but. Is there a similar uh, parallel to the uh, complement lattice and second order, uh, second order logic in, in traditional uh, set theory? You know, because uh, it, it 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 smells quite similar. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I, know I mean, category the, theory is full of those things that smell similar. Yeah, well, I mean, the the category theoretic view, right, is just that you start with an order, and then lattice theory is sort of like it was originally lattice theory was originally developed uh, in set theory. Uh, and not in category theory at all. But now people talk about it in terms of category. So I was a little bit joking that we needed category theory. We don't really, but it, it does show you the diagram, uh, the, the, the composition of arrows is the thing that I think is kind of interesting that's yeah. sort of category theoretic. I think lattices are re very useful for all sorts of complex multifactorial stage-based things. Like if you imagine a uh, user sign-up journeys or something really simple like that, there's a whole bunch of different states, you know, has done X, has done Y type of thing. And, and it actually, it pays off to actually draw out the lattice to yeah. see well, which journeys are possible. And have we thought about the user who has logged in and has signed up with their credit card, but it's been rejected and they want to refresh it or whatever the hell, you know what I mean? Like, so it's, it's actually a, a very useful exercise in lots of domains. The only, uh, sorry, I'll shut up now and let other people speak, but the only other comment I had was, uh, so it sounds to me like this is really a candidate for in short-term inclusion into a pre-compiler in to be prologue. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I wrote um, this structural one, like uh, I wrote it on Thursday and then destroyed it on Friday or, Friday <laughs> or whatever it was, uh, Wednesday and or Tuesday and Wednesday or something like that. But I've, I have it back. So I rewrote it from scratch. Uh, yeah. And now it's it's shrunk every time I did it. <laughs> now it's only like yes. fifty lines or something like, like that. And it, and well, I mean, I ran into a bunch of examples. Useful, 
yeah. immediately useful for us considering those, those numbers of the amount of times if we can move all that work into a pre-compiler that and the pre-compiler will be better at spotting these things as well so uh, we should get big performance improvements in a lot of things there but also it, it seems like a no-brainer to throw in as a, as a simple pre-compilation -comp stage into sweet prologue yeah no absolutely we, we it, it, I've wrote it in such a way now that there's just a package and you just include the package and then you say that you want to use it uh, per file or per predicate and it will optimize either by file. And I think I might just also have an option where it optimize everything and it doesn't check and <laughs> just tries to do it on everything that runs. Yeah. Yeah. Good, cool. Okay, that's all my how uh, is this sort of thing culturally treated in the sweet prologue community i mean is there a general acceptance of this sort of thing or how, how does that go down in there is it i'm not really exposed i see you getting in fights with or helen getting in fights with people on forums <laughs> but, uh, apart from that i'm not really exposed so yeah no that's a very good question it's a very good question because like one might think that such an optimization would already exist at least for the structural equality case because it is so incredibly simple. I mean, if, if you have an optimizer that, that is only like, you know, 10 lines long, why is it not already included in the source code? So um, I think, you know, Swipple has really uh, uh, taken the approach of just trying to keep things as simple as possible in the core language and not introduce too many program transformation tricks because they can, like program transformation can be incredibly subtle. And there's like, you might think that it works in all cases. And in fact, uh, it doesn't. <laughs> so Ooh. it's very easy to introduce like um, problems that you didn't think about uh, that, you know, will, will really mess up your code. So, but I think Jan would probably be open to, to uh, inclusion of this, at least the structural equality one. The other, the other ones are complicated in the sense that they utilize uh, constraint logic domains for several domains, including requiring the uh, real number uh, constraint logic library to be installed. So I'm not sure if that one is a candidate, but certainly the structural equality one, I think he would be open to, to including it. Now, an example of where there's pervasive transformation is the, um, the, uh, the Lambda, what's it called? The, it's called the- uh, Yao. Y'all, that's yeah, right. The y'all, the the y'all edition. Uh, it uh, does transformation all over the place on uh, source code, and it's been included uh, by default. So I, I think this is slightly less complex. Uh, so I, I'd say it, it's likely to get included if we add uh, if we ask Yon. Cool. Yeah, because I'm just uh, thinking of uh, Log Talks interaction with the Prolog community over the week, and he was quite uh, critical of their uh, manner of thought, let's say. I would say they're incredibly conservative about changes <laughs> and like probably unnecessarily so. And like, you know, it's one thing if you have huge code bases out there and you need to keep backward compatibility, yeah. but there's a, lot of, there's a lot of love for the ISO standard that is just not justified anymore. Nobody is using Prolog in an industrial setting uh, except us. <laughs> So, I mean, there's like us and three others or something like that. So, uh, you know, you're not talking about breaking a lot of things if, if you go about making improvements. And I think that that conservatism does not serve the community very well. That's my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So when are we going to integrate it? Like, uh, is it? Is it ready enough that we can just turn it on for our own, for our own code and, and see what happens? It is, it is ready enough to do that. So uh, cool. I've, I have uh, tested it on, on some of our own code. And so um, let me just finish up the pack and then we can pack install it and see what happens. Wonderful. Awesome. Great, let's do that. I have another question, by the way. Go for it. Okay. Um, I really like the guard syntax. Uh, why, uh, I didn't completely understand why you got rid of it since uh, it makes it very explicit that this is the condition in which the uh, class should run. Yeah, so uh, one is that, uh, so, so there's two things, I guess. One is if you put a guard on, 
uh, it probably means that you mean for the thing to be deterministic on which case to use. So you actually want to either you want a semi debt uh, predicate. It wants mm -hmm. to be semi deterministic, which means semi deterministic means it either fails or if it doesn't fail, it computes exactly one answer, right? Uh, so if you're using guarded clauses, you probably mean for that to happen. And so in the case that it doesn't happen, you probably want an error, right? You want it to throw some kind of nasty warning that says, you know, uh, did you know your guarded clauses are, are not right? Um, but the other thing is that you have to go back and write all of your code with guards in it. Uh, and in fact, a lot of our code is already written in a sort of guarded style. And so you could automatically just guess what the guard is uh, and then just insert cuts whenever it's appropriate. Uh, so um, no, if you like the guarded syntax, you know, it's easy enough to add it. So could cool. be done. But I also think like the idea of, of throwing the error when you figure out that it's not semi that, that's actually very helpful because yeah. often we actually do want to know and not just have a non-deterministic predicate when we really think it's uh, deterministic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, I can include the guarded uh, clause syntax as well. <laughs> so my question, uh, I have a question about how this actually um, works from uh, from a compiling point of view. So there isn't any kind of concept of, uh, you're not Sorry, actually- Dimitri, can't really hear you. Could you just move your mic maybe? Is that better? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah so uh, when, you, when you make code that depends on, uh, on, on on, on these optimizations, how does that code end up uh, being distributed? How do you hook in uh, your, uh, your modifications? Yeah, okay, so let me just show you really quickly. Okay, can you see my code? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is, this is the Rayify, pra uh, so this just does reification. Sorry, this is the wrong one. Let's see, let's look at, uh, um, optimize.pl. Here we go. So this is the optimizer. The optimizer hooks in to the system with this thing called term expansion. Mm -hmm. Okay. So term expansion, there's, there's three different parts here. One is whenever the beginning of the file is reached. Uh, so it, whenever the prolog compiler is initiated on a new file to load it, then we fire off uh, this code here. Okay, so we get to hook into the prolog compiler itself and add another thing to do whenever the beginning of file is reached. Okay. And what it does is, in this case, I, uh, I check to see what my current context is. So what module am I in currently? Um, and I check to see if, the, uh, if, this, if we actually want to have guarded syntax in this module. Uh, so we have a predicate that checks to see if this module is supposed to have the optimizer on. Uh, and in every, and if, if so, then I make sure that I have no remaining uh, optimiz program optimizations in, uh, in any of these predicates that I use to store information temporarily. Okay, uh, when I reach the end of the file, then I uh, check to make sure this is one of those files that I was doing a module that I was actually going to do guards on. Uh, and then I get this collection of all transformed terms and I spit them out. And when I spit them out, the prologue compiler sees these as if it was source code. Mm -hmm. So I can spit these terms back out to it and, and uh, it reads them as source code. Um, and if I get an or some other term, so I'm reading through the file now and I get these terms one by one as they're encountered in the file, I check to see if uh, I'm supposed to be doing transformation on this module uh, I, I do a reify reflect, which takes the the incoming term, reflects reflects it into some kind of uh, representation of a, a prolog term as a statement, and then I check to see if this statement is one of the participating clauses. So a participating clause is one that is supposed to be optimized, and that's just some predicate. So if my participating clause predicate says optimize everything, then it'll try to optimize it no matter what. Finally, uh, I do an assert Z uh, and add this statement, the reflected statement to a predicate that just stores information about every clause that I'm supposed to be optimizing. 
So then uh, this transformed terms, uh, what it does is it goes through, it looks for every predicate clause in the program that I've encountered. Uh, it does an optimization of those clauses and then it does uh, reify reflect. Since reify reflect is actually a true relation, it takes things on one side, returns them or goes backwards the other direction. I can do a reify reflect or reflect reify uh, with the same uh, predicate. I get back my terms from the optimized reflection and then I return them to uh, prolog. So that's, and then prolog reads them as though it was source. And, and how do you mark a module as wanting a guard? Uh, to mark a module as wanting a guard, I have um, module wants guard says that, okay, so this is, this is not the, uh, hang on a second to quality optimize. So, uh, sorry. Um, sorry, I think I'm in the, the wrong. Okay, so yeah, no, it, ju it just checks to see if um, I'm not the module optimize. Um, and then it, if I've imported optimize from the optimize uh, module. So, so if you import the optimize module, then you will have the symbol optimize uh, in your module. And then if you're not yourself, I don't want to optimize myself. So I don't uh, optimize if the module name is optimized because otherwise uh, it gets circular. Great. And so then and a participating clause is uh, if you have this uh, special predicate participating clause and your predicate name is named in that participating clause predicate and you're a clause, so you have to be a clause, you can't be a de declaration. Um, so there's two different sorts of forms in prolog. Uh, which you can see in reify, uh, oops, sorry, that's, that's not reify reflect. Here we go, reify. So the different kinds of clauses are, there's declarations, there's uh, DCGs, uh, there's uh, normal prologue uh, terms or predicate forms, and then there's a sort of bodyless predicate. And so we transform all of these into clauses except declarations, which get a special one. So you can mark a, a, a predicate as being optimizable by saying that it's a participating clause by, by giving its predicate name uh, to participating clause. And you can do that by in your module that you're interested in, you can say optimize predicate name or you can say optimize all and then it, the predicate will return true for every argument. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and so that means that uh, um, since you don't mark the module uh, as wanting a guard inside the module itself, that you could potentially, if somebody were to use that module in a different code base that didn't have this, then that module um, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be optimized. So there wouldn't be any problem from a logic point of view, but certain clauses would be unnecessarily called, certain predicates would be unnecessarily called twice. Yeah. Or yeah. multiple times. Makes sense. That's right. Yeah, so it, it shouldn't change the semantics, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, it does change the number of times that something is like sometimes you can end up with choice points and sometimes it is actually possible to view whether or not you've ha you have remaining choice points. Uh, so there's a subtlety there, but uh, right. Gavin, I won't believe you're tr it's correct until you've written a program and I do to prove it, man. <laughs> <laughs> I know you want it. I know, yeah. <laughs> So Gavin, shouldn't these dynamics be uh, thread local? They should, yes. Actually, they should be declared thread local. Probably. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Give it a think. Yeah, I'll think about it. 
Yeah, I'll have to look through. I, you know, that's that's one thing I I think in the interface that I didn't really like. Uh, so this this interface of uh, of having a term expansion, uh, that's it's not a it's sort of widely used, but it's not in the ISO standard anywhere, uh, and it's something that's sort of been grandfathered in. I can't remember where it was originally, B Prolog or something like that. Jan said once where it comes from, but it's a syntax that was used somewhere else. But the problem of getting it clause by clause is is that it's really awkward and irritating. It would be nice if you got predicate clauses all in a lump, and then you could be completely declarative about your transformation. Instead, I have to assert these things into some temporary clause, uh, into some temporary predicate, and then read them back out, uh, which I find really awkward and irritating, uh, but that's, that's life. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Awesome. Well yeah. done. Fantastic. Cool. Really remarkable.